Missouri, Missouri, <laughs> sorry. Um, and we have uh, Secretary uh, Miguel Cardona as well. Um, we're gonna start with Jen, so I'll kick it off to you first. Um, and uh, have you introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about what you do. Thanks so much, Kenny, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jen Mishori. I'm Dr. Biden's Education and Workforce Advisor. Uh, really excited to join you all today for this back to school uh, conversation. And um, as many of you know, fall means back to school for the First Lady as well. Uh, so to this day, Dr. Biden teaches at a community college in Virginia as the first First Lady to continue her career while serving in the role. And it's those experiences in the classroom that have shaped her approach to education and workforce policy, work that started during her tenure as second lady and has continued on through the Biden administration. It's an approach that combines a bold vision and concrete plan for transforming our education system and a sustained commitment to showing why this matters through storytelling and shining a light on how policies impact people's lives. So as students head back to the classroom this fall, it's exciting to think about how these transformations are impacting the lives of students. For many years, Dr. Biden has been focused on supporting and advocating for our nation's community colleges and community college students. When Dr. Biden was second lady, she would often say that community colleges are America's best kept secret. But I think we can all agree now that community colleges are, are simply not a secret anymore. They're a critical component of the workforce and economic development strategy of this administration. And we've made real progress in making them affordable and accessible. As students head back to community college campuses, many won't have to pay tuition. They may be enrolled in a free college program, programs that have benefited from a steady drumbeat of expansion since the free college effort took off in earnest uh, under her leadership and vision as second lady, uh, and have been propelled forward by, the, uh, by American Rescue Plan funds and state investments since then. And other students will benefit from historic increases to the Pell Grant secured by the Biden-Harris administration. Dr. Biden has also put forth a bold vision to rethink connections between high schools, community colleges, and careers. A vision reflected in the new Pilot Career Connected High School Grant Program run by the Department of Education, as well as the President's Classroom to Career Budget Proposal, a $7.2 billion proposal to provide 12 credits of free career connected dual enrollment courses to all students. <clears throat> From Green Bay, Wisconsin to Greensboro, North Carolina, she's highlighted those state models that are making those connections at scale while encouraging more action to expand those programs. This fall, about one in five students on a community college campus may actually be uh, in high school. And we'll be continuing the work to ensure that more students have that opportunity and that they're taking classes that give them a leg up on their career goals. And finally, Dr. Biden has been crisscross crisscrossing the country in support of local workforce efforts that prepare people for the jobs created by President Biden's investments in key sectors like clean energy and manufacturing, launching the White House workforce hubs in locations receiving significant Investing in America funds to support and highlight models with strong connections between community colleges, labor, employers, and high schools. This fall, students in those hubs will enroll in new apprenticeships, new CTE programs, and new community college programs. And we're so excited about the progress that is already being made in those communities. But of course the work is not done and we simply can't do this alone. Everyone on this call has a role to play to ensure that students in your communities benefit from the jobs the president has created and have access to education and job training pathways to secure those jobs. So I hope you'll be a partner with our office this fall as we look to elevate and replicate the great work happening to make that a reality. Back to you, Kenny. Thanks, Jen. Uh, it's always so good to hear what's coming out of the First Lady's office. Very, very excited to have you on this call. Thank you. Uh, next up, it is my great honor to introduce the uh, Secretary of Education, uh, Dr. Miguel Cardona. Secretary, welcome. How are you? Good to, good to see you. Good to be with you all. Uh, and Jen, you know, Jen Mishori is, is special. Um, she was good. She used to work at the Department of Education and uh, the uh, First Lady brought her over there because that's how good she is. Um, but let me just say a word about um, Dr. Biden. You know, one of the things that I'm going to think about uh, in the future when I look back at my time as Secretary of Education is the ability to be just to, to be in her presence. The First Lady is as real as they come. Um, you know, I've been on the, the plane with her 
and uh, traveling to different locations and she's correcting papers. Uh, she's a teacher, man. She cares about students. It's about the students. It's about the community. It's about our country. And uh, Pathways is something that she's really passionate about and how the role of community colleges in, in lifting up our country. And uh, let me tell you, she, she gets it. She gets it. So um, I just think sometimes, you know, we're so busy in the work, we don't realize how, how, how blessed we are to have uh, a first lady like Dr. Biden who walks the walk, man. She not only talks the talk, she walks the walk. And uh, it's, it's just been an honor to work with her. Um, and when I interviewed for this position, um, she was in that room, man. There's nobody that understands the role of education in this country better than her. And I'm just so thankful that, you know, we talk about advisors to the president. She's the best advisor to the president. And, uh, I'm, and we're fortunate as a in this country to have her. And, and I just want to say hello to everyone. You know, it's back to school season across the country. And for me, as a lifelong educator, I started as a fourth grade teacher. Uh, there's no more special time than this time when, you know, you walk through the hallways, there's something special. And I know many of you on this call have children or uh, family members, grandchildren, maybe that uh, have started school this week or last week. You know that feeling, the nerves, you know, the, they have brand new clothes, their, their shoes, that the schools are squeaky clean. The, the, the hallways are shiny. Teachers are setting up their classrooms. The bulletin boards look good. Kids are excited to to see their friends show off their new kicks and their new fade or whatever. Parents are ready to send their kids back, get them into the routines. It's really a special time of year. And as a father um, who just two weeks ago experienced the empty nest syndrome, when I brought my baby to college, my, both my kids are in college, you know, it's, it's a period of transition for, for families across the country. Um, but that's one of the great things about public education. It, it, really provides opportunities for a new start and it really brings people together. Virtually every great American success story starts with public education, with teachers dedicated to learning, with parents devoted to their children's success and school leaders, staff and community partners determined to ensure every student is safe and supported. At the height of the pandemic, President Biden and Vice President Harris chose a teacher to be their secretary of education. They wanted someone who would Help schools leverage the American Rescue Plan's $130 billion investment in public education. Someone who would champion what works in the classroom and what works to raise the bar for students. Someone who would push for greater support for the whole child and pathways to college and career. And someone who believed public education and f would fight for it. And let me tell you, I'm fighting for it because look at what it did for me. I am the first in my family to go to college and I only had what my local neighborhood public school offered. That's all I had. And I had in it teachers in a system that saw more potential in me than I even saw. Um, the thought that I had any opportunity available to me if I worked hard. Um, and it was those public schools that opened those doors for me. We're fighting for public education because it is the foundation of opportunity in this country. But not everyone feels that way. Not everyone feels that way. We're, we're, today, we're fighting for public education against those people who want to wage culture wars and abandon multilingual learners. They want to create divisions and create boogeymen, uh, whether it's masks or uh, books that they're trying to ban or CRT or you know, whatever it is. Every year, there's something new. We're fighting for public education against those who think it's okay for kids to go hungry in classrooms, or it's okay for kids who are dealing with trauma to uh, go ahead without access to mental health services. We're fighting for public education against those who wanna stoke fear over students who are different instead of standing up against real threats like bullying and gun violence. We're fighting for public education against those who want to use taxpayer dollars to sub subsidize the wealthy's private school tuition. Simply put, we're fighting for public education against those who want to defund it, they want to gut it, they want to privatize it through vouchers, and at the end of the day, turn Americans against public education. Well, let me tell you, it's not going to work. Uh, next week, I'll be taking a bus tour to Wisconsin. I'm going to be stopping in Indiana, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. 
um, and, and Illinois as well. And every one of those states, I'll see the way our communities come together for public education. Nothing unites us more as Americans than our hopes and our dreams for our children. And those hopes and dreams take flight in America's public schools. So I want to thank you for joining that fight. And I'm honored to be here with you today. Happy to take some questions and uh, I'll turn it over back to you now. Great, thank you, Mr. Secretary. We're gonna go ahead and move on to the question and answer portion of this call. Um, when we sent out the invite to folks to join the call, they sent in questions and I have a few questions for both you, Mr. Secretary and you, Jen. Um, the first question is for Secretary Cardona. What can be done about the book bans that are happening across the country? Uh, you know, if you look at, if you break down the books that are being banned, um, they're disproportionately high in having black and brown protag protagonists um, or um, supporting and representing students who are underserved and marginalized in our schools. So it, to me, the book bans are proxies for desegregation or, or, or trying to discriminate um, uh, segregation, excuse me, or trying to discriminate against specific authors, black authors in particular. Um, what can we do? We can speak up. We, we have to, you know, it's, it's often the vocal minority that get all the attention and get the headlines. We have to speak up in favor of, um, uh, you know, allowing books to be in our schools and ensuring that it's not one person who's making a decision for all the kids in that community. I just say advocacy you know, your voice at board meetings, um, letting people know that, um, you know, that you're not okay with this, that this goes counter to what public education is. Um, I would also argue that we got to do a better job um, mobilizing uh, around books that we want to see in our schools. You know, I, I, I developed a friendship over the last several years with John Leguizamo. And if you guys know John Leguizamo, man, this guy is a walking encyclopedia of Latin history. And he talks about you know, the history of our country and the, the Latino influence. I'm like, why are we, instead of defending ourselves against these book bands that want to go after titles of diverse content, why aren't we promoting good diverse content or lifting up, um, you know, the, the, that districts look at diverse content as a, as a baseline for education, not only for black and brown kids or kids, indigenous uh, students or students who are LGBTQ, but for all kids, because, it is the role of education to get kids ready for a culture that is different than theirs too, right? I, I talk about Rudine Sims Bishop, um, a black author who talked about um, curriculum being um, uh, windows, mirrors, and sliding glass doors. It's a window into another culture. It's a, it's a mirror. So you see yourself in your literature that you're reading and, and sliding glass doors so you could take a walk into another culture for a little bit and learn about it. It's sad that today... There are more books with puppies and, and dogs and animals being the protagonist than there are Latinos being the protagonist. But we got work to do. And I think sometimes we just got to stand up and be loud and, um, you know, lift up what we believe instead of just defending against what others believe. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. The next question we have is for Jen. Can you give us a little more information about the First Lady's work around high schools and careers? Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, this work is happening, um, you know, with with the Department of Education, I think, um, you know, there's, there's, she really has a vision, um, and this administration has a vision to make the connection between high school and career and in college more seamless. Um, and so um, we're so excited about, um, you know, the models that the Department of Education is funding across the country that um, support districts that are really serious about providing work-based learning, providing dual enrollment opportunities, career advising, access to workforce credentials while in high school. Um, and this is happening. You know, we, we went out to Wisconsin um, where they've increased the number of high school students participating in youth apprenticeship more than threefold in the past decade. And they got a grant from the Department of Education to support reaching more schools um, to really connect into things like career advising, um, and other efforts to really put students on that path. We visited a technical center in Washington, D.C., where they're creating, um, you know, free dual enrollment opportunities for high school students in really well-paying fields like nursing and cybersecurity. So we know this is happening across the country, um, but we really also want to see that scaled um, so that all students have those opportunities. Thanks, Jen. 
Next question I have for Secretary Cardona. You mentioned a little bit about how you were an educator. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what Ed is doing to incentivize teaching as a profession? Yeah. First of all, we're saying that the teacher shortage that you keep hearing about in the news these days is, is a symptom of a teacher respect issue in this country. I often talk about, we don't have enough acronyms in, in, in education. I often talk about the ABCs of education, you know, providing teachers agency, meaning treat them like professionals, man. They're, they're tr you know, they have degrees, multiple degrees. Um, give them agency, give them voice. They should be a part of the decision-making process. Be better working conditions, right? That means career pathways. So it's not just about getting, bringing teachers into the profession. It's about keeping them because we're losing a lot of teachers too. So making sure that if I'm a teacher and I love working with other teachers, I could be a teacher leader and I could provide professional development. I don't have to leave the classroom, but I have career options for myself, right? Um, better working conditions also mean that you're not working in 98 degree classrooms because you can't have air conditioning and it just, it's just a bad working condition where we wouldn't accept that for any other industry doesn't put people to work in 98 degree weather um, in classrooms that don't have ventilation. We normalize that in education. So we got to be honest about um, agency, better working conditions, and competitive salary. Teachers, on average, make 26% less than people with similar degrees. So we need to stop talking about it and being about it, right? We've been pushing hard. Over 30 states have increased teacher salaries since uh, President Biden took office. We're proud about that. And if you look, we have dashboards and, and our website. We, we, we're holding states accountable for this work. We're also funding some of this work, right? So we have over a billion dollars in teacher quality grants that go to professional development to help with that better working conditions, um, that help develop systems where agencies allowed, and that also support retention and re uh, recruitment strategies. I'm proud that President Biden was the first president to ever put dollars in the Augusta Hawkins grant, which is a grow your own program intended to diversify the teaching profession. I always say the profession will be better if we can have our professional staff look as beautifully diverse as our student body, right? So we have work to do. The Augusta Hawkins grant, I believe it's up to $50 million. It started with zero. Um, the president was the first, it was there for a while, but never had money in it. The president put some money in it. So we're doing that. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, we're working on apprenticeships too. Name another profession where they expect you to work for four months for free before you get into it. The teaching profession, student teaching, you don't get paid. So we want black and brown teachers. You, you're telling them that they have to work for four months for free. How are you going to get people into a profession when they have lucrative uh, opportunities, thanks to the president, um, with non-four-year degree programs, getting into uh, high-paying careers? Um, there's no mention of not getting paid while you're doing an internship. So we brought in apprenticeships. When we started, when President Biden took office, there were zero states doing it. We're up to like 38 states that have apprenticeships. So thanks to um, you know our partnership with the Office of the First Lady, we're, we're getting things done to get more dollars into the profession, lift it. Um, we're not going to stop fighting for that because uh, we know that you know. And, and I say this sometimes, Kenny, and you know sometimes. And there's no. This is my own hunch, but I've been in education for 25 years. I could have a hunch. If this profession. It's 75% women now. If it was 75% men, would we be having this conversation? Right? So we have to be honest. We have to be unapologetic. We have to say pay our teachers more, period. The president said it at the State of the Union. You heard him. Um, and it's true. No other profession is possible if it's not through education, through teaching. Um, and, yeah, we're, we're close to another crisis. We remember what it was like when schools closed down because of a, of a pandemic. Let's not get there because we're not paying or respecting our, profession, our professional teachers enough. I can go on all day about that. We have grants. We're using the bully pulpit, and we're not afraid to do it. You know, we really appreciate all your work. Um, Jen, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, we're coming up at time. Uh, I just want to thank you both for taking the time to, to be on this call to give us uh, a little bit of um, a peek behind the curtain of what's happening in education. It's really incredible all the work that you've done um, and all the work that we've been able to do together as an administration. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your work. Um, and let's go get it done for the next uh, several months. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys.